What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access. As always, please hit that subscribe button. It's right down there, and it's free. That enables us to keep coming to y'all as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. So please hit that subscribe button, like our content, share it, talk about it, be about it, each one, teach one, and we appreciate your support in getting us this far. Now, today, we have the honor and privilege of being joined by two of the men behind the film that is out now worldwide. It's called The Invaders. We have director Pritchard Smith and John B. Smith, one of the invaders. Thank you both for coming through. All right. Yeah, thanks again for having us. Yes. So everybody should definitely watch The Invaders after you watch this interview or pause the interview now to watch the film and come back to us. But it's available, uh, video on demand everywhere, worldwide, iTunes, Apple TV, Prime Video, and elsewhere. John B. Smith, for you, I wanted to get right off the gate uh, with The Invaders Looking back, as you guys were forming this organization in Memphis uh, back in the day, what now that you look back, what is the significance of what you guys did just to form the organization in the midst of the civil rights era? Well, for me, everything began with the infamous gas cap incident, because prior to the uh, gas cap incident, I was a good colored boy. You know, I was raised to be a good colored boy and I'd gone to the military, you know, because that was what you did. And I got out in 66, got a, what I thought was a good job, had an apartment, had a car, a 62 Volkswagen, and I was living a playboy's life until Charles Cabbage came home. Charles Cabbage, we had known each other since the second grade. We had gone to high school together, played football together, but Charles also played basketball. And he was a quarterback and I was the end. So we had this synergy between us, not just because we grew up together, but we had worked together. But when he comes home from Morehouse, he's total black power. He's looking like uh, Stokely Carmichael. He's got a big Afro. He's wearing, uh, got an amulet around his neck. He's wearing a dashiki, sandals and Levi's, which is not the kind of get up that we wore. You know, we were still wearing dress slacks, uh, ties and those kinds of things. So that uh, contrast really began the effort of, I felt like he had been brainwashed. So I needed to save him. And he looked at me basically the same way that I had been brainwashed from, you know, the past. So we debated back and forth about the merits of black power. And uh, I was pushing the Bill of Rights and, you know, things like that, the constitution, it gave me rights so I could, uh, you know, live life as an American. Well, this particular night, we were on the way over to my apartment and I had to stop and get gas. And I pulled into the service station, which was right on the uh, way that I go. I go in there often to get gas. And the guy comes out, this is before self-service. He comes out and uh, I had developed this habit of, of getting out because the 62 Volkswagen didn't have an outside gas port. You had to get out and lift the hood to get to the gas. So I had lost a couple of gas caps previously. And as a matter of fact, this guy that was putting gas in my car had sold me the one that was on the car. So when he finishes, he tells me, uh, it's $3.10. That's what it took to fill up a Volkswagen. <laughs> Never will forget those numbers. But- uh, The good old days. <laughs> and he also follows with, uh, you know, you don't have a gas cap. And I'm saying, well, I had one when I came in. So I get out and I'm looking around because I figure it's got to be in the truck someplace, but I don't see it. And being from the hood, you know, you go in a grocery store and you want to get some chips or some cookies. So you just slide them inside your shirt, button your shirt up and slide on out the door. So I knew he had to have it on him because he hadn't gone any place. And I looked and I can see that budge on the side. I reached out and touched it and it was my gas cap. Well, 
being an old white guy, he starts ranting and raving about me putting my hand on a white man. And if, uh, you know, he, if I didn't uh, get off his lot, he might shoot me myself, shoot me himself. Well, this is when my being a good color boy comes to the fore. Because see, I felt I had rights. I had gone to the military, I'd served well, got an honorable discharge. So I should have rights. So I tell him, no, you don't have to call the police. I'll call the police. So I go to the phone booth on the corner, call the police. Of course, they come. And uh, while this is uh, happening, uh, people in the neighborhood who know me and know, know the Volkswagen, they start stopping. And they, there's a nice little crowd across the street from the gas station. And this lieutenant that comes up, uh, I approach him about my gas cap. And he said, I don't know nothing about a gas cap. I got a ride situation here that I got to control. And the thing of it is, this is a week after Detroit had exploded. So police all over the country are, you know, on alert. And so when he says that, you know, I'm like, I, I don't know what you're talking about, but I called you. I want my gas cap. This guy's a thief. He stole my gas cap. And so he tells me, well, if you don't get in your car and leave, we're going to uh, arrest you. So I'm like, you got to arrest me because I'm not leaving without my gas cap. And this is Charles Cabbage's in the car. So my performance really was geared more toward him because he was the one that was saying, man, you don't have any rights. Bill, when they wrote the Bill of Rights, your folks were slaves and you know things like that. So I'm trying to prove to him that I got rights. And so when this guy tells me that, I'm like, no. I got rights. I got to get my gas cap. So they arrest me. But that incident is what really brings home to me the fact that uh, Black people in America really don't have rights. We're not covered by the Bill of Rights or any of that in, uh, in the South, especially. So that was how I got uh, jumped into Black power. Well, let me ask you this, John, because when I watched The Invaders, which I thought was a great film, one thing that I was intrigued and curious about is being in the military, being when you grew up and being living in the South, being in Memphis, was this gas cap incident that you guys discuss in The Invaders? Was that your first time where you had faced this r rampant discrimination? Because I was I thought it was I was intrigued that well, wait, is this the first time it was he just in a bubble or not experiencing what a lot of other people were? I didn't understand why that in particular, had that never happened to you before or? Well, it was the one time that I came face to face with my real condition, because like I said, I had gone through life that educated to believe that I had rights and that uh, the law would protect me just like it protects anyone. So this is my dilemma now because I'm faced with the situation of you know, not being recognized as an American and having gone through Vietnam and all of that and coming home to face uh, an old redneck who probably had not gone to Vietnam or, or the military at all. And so all of that really comes to me as Charles was right. He understood the political situation far better than I did. So this is when Black power becomes a reality for me. And so we began to, first of all, the incident itself was picked up by the NAACP. And of course they saw it as an opportunity to uh, uh, use the press to tell the community about what happens to a black man 
when he gets his gas cap stolen, you know, that kind of thing. So this is what really introduces me into the civil rights, uh, black power uh, situation that was just beginning to develop in the country. Okay. And then Pritchard, for you as a filmmaker, um, what drew you to the invaders as a project? And once you started learning about it, or as you were delving into it more on the film side of things, made you want to make this into a documentary? Um, well, I, I actually heard about the invaders uh, one Christmas. I was visiting my mom, and um, she was a librarian at a black school in Memphis uh, around the time of King's assassination. And she mentioned them to me and had kind of just a a vague understanding of who they were. And I'd never heard of them before. And I've always kind of been interested in sort of counterculture, uh, underground groups and whatnot. And uh, that night I was at a friend's house and he had met an invader before. And I was like, how, like, how do we not know about this? And he kind of knew more than I did about it at the time. Um, and he's an old friend of mine, uh, JB Harrell, and he ended up helping me produce it. But the more he kind of, um, explained to me sort of like what their position was back in 1968. And uh, the, you know, the more we kind of dug into it, we actually went to the library the next day and just started like looking up all the stuff we could find. And um, it was just clear that there was a story there, especially when we realized that, that Dr. King had reached out to them when they were accused of starting the riot uh, during the sanitation strike. And that there was this sort of connection between them and Dr. King um, we just wanted to know more, you know, and just try and, you know, I'm from Memphis. I mean, I've been in New York for the last 20 years almost, but, um, it just seems strange to me that I'd, I'd never heard of it before and just really intriguing. And then of course, once we met John B and Kobe Smith and Calvin and all the guys, um, just kind of realized that, you know, this is kind of a, an untold, uh, aspect of, of that story that, that in order to have the full story should be told. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, from reading and studying history, I knew of the sanitation strike and the issues, but I didn't know about the invaders. So when I was reading about the film and learned these extra layers, I was excited to watch it. So, John, for you, I was also intrigued because there were a lot of uh, similarities and parallels to some of your initiatives with the Black Panthers, with the free meals and the education and helping children. So, uh, did you? happened to develop those on your own? Did you model yourselves after them? How did that work for the invaders, John? Well, you know, we didn't just jump into, um, you know, Black Power organizing right away. It took, uh, oh, about three or four months before we started to, because uh, I met, we met, I met Kobe for the first time. Charles and he had uh, gone, had gotten together down in Morehouse. And since they both were from Memphis, they had talked about coming back home and starting an organization. Me, I was sort of like the tag along then because I didn't know that I hadn't read the books. I hadn't studied black power. I was a good colored boy. So I had to uh, actually uh, just go along and be a part of the group while I kind of get my feet under me in terms of this totally new experience. And so Cab and Kobe, they were like the front guys uh, in the organization until we approached uh, the sanitation strike, which happened uh, maybe four or five months uh, the after we got involved. So we were doing things like trying to start a Black Student Association at Memphis State, uh, Christian Brothers, Lamont College and Southwestern. Kobe went to uh, Southwestern. I went to, uh, I was at Lamont. So we used that as our base to really begin trying to organize. Okay. And with this organization, both Pritchard and John, I wanted you to address one of the themes that I got from the invaders that was a through line of the film 
was a responsibility to the community, not only for the invaders, but just people in general that I think uh, in a lot of ways <laughs> we lack today. And I think that it was very pervasive from reading, talking to elders and understanding how things quote unquote used to be that I think we've lost as a society in a lot of ways, not only from uh, in every way, basically. So for uh, Pritchard, I wanted you to address that as a filmmaker. And then John, I wanted you to address that as, you know, growing up in Memphis and, and seeing how things have evolved from the 60s to 2022 era. Yeah, I think um, I think that's what's kind of so compelling about the story. And, and even though the guys are obviously, you know, older now, um, to see the pictures of them back then, you know, it really is like, I mean, Charles Cabbage is, I think, 20 around that time. He's, I think, 20 years old, maybe 21. He looks like he's 17, you know? And to see these guys doing things, you know, to help their community and to try and, you know, kind of gain some equality in their community and in their city at that age is definitely, to your point, lost these days. And um, I mean, I really hope that young people watch this film and, you know, it challenges them to, to, to do more for their own communities. Well, uh, my entrance into it, as I was saying earlier, uh, had to do with my mother. She's 102 now, and she's uh, always been a community person. Charles's mother, she had always been a community uh, person. They organized the uh, community uh, civic club. Uh, there, there was a uh, refinery, Valero, down at the end of our neighborhood. It was spewing uh, toxic fumes. So they got into, uh, you know, talking to Valero about that. So my interest into uh, social activism was somewhat a part of that. But what really got me uh, started as, a, as an individual where I stepped out of the shadow of Kobe and Charles and started to shot, shot things on my own was due to uh, the students. Uh, my apartment set right in the back door of Carver High School. That was the school that I had uh, gone to, uh, Charles and I, and his brothers and sisters were going to the school then. And so when Charles started talking Black power and Black history, they started going to school and demanding Black books in the library and the ability to wear uh, Afrocentric clothes to school and where Afro Willow Boyd had uh, outlawed all of that. And any student that came to school wearing an Afro, they kicked them out of school. So there was about oh, seven or eight of them that had been kicked out. So that became uh, my interest in how do I help these guys get back in school? And uh, one of the young guys, he was an artist. His name was Donnie Delaney. And he had uh, cut the sleeves out of his Levi jacket and decorated the back of his jacket and written the word invaders across the top of the back of the jacket. And I'm like, Donnie, what's that all about? Well, at that time, there was this TV program that uh, the aliens had come to earth with the idea of making it their world. And so his take on it was, that was what we are trying to do. We are trying to make America our world. So I identified with that. And I, that's when I put the uh, word invaders across the back of my jacket. So that was uh, an independent step away from what Charles and Kobe was doing and more towards what the young people were interested in. Hmm. 
Okay. And that, that balance, I think, is important because, you know, seeing the jackets in, in the film, The Invaders, I thought it was, it was a nice touch, Pritchard, that I think you and, and the editing staff did was showing that because it's a, you know, it's an identifying marker, but it also shows like this is an organization that's, you know, about unity and trying to make these differences.